following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. And Adam became a living soul. Today we are going to study the first uh, verses of the second book of Genesis. Since we uh, finished with the uh, first uh, chapter in the previous lecture where we talk about how the souls comes into the earth and we started talking about the making <coughs> of the of Adam into the image and likeness of God. This, of course, is uh, very extensive and profound task to do in each one of us. But it is always explained in synthesis in the seventh day. And uh, we, you will see how, uh, Kabbalistically, all of these uh, truths are hidden and how, by knowing the doctrine of that, knowledge, gnosis, is how we uncover that which is covered by the great masters of Kabbalah and alchemy. To begin, observed that uh, in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, where in different verses is explained what we already gave in different lectures, the name Yod He Vav He is not mentioned. Only when we enter into the second day of Genesis. And this is very significant. Why this name is mentioned precisely when we read and Yod Chava Elohim formed Adam of the dust of Adama and breathed into his nostrils the neshama of life, and Adam became a living soul. In the other days of Genesis, you read, and Elohim said, but he is yod he vav he and it is because the intervention of yod he vav he is necessary indispensable in order to make 
Adam, a living soul. Without the intervention of yod he vav he, it's impossible to form Adam, a living soul. The first, of course, this is related with making Adam into the image and likeness of God. It's a very long process of alchemy that we are going to explain and that uh, in the seventh day is synthesized in three steps that we are going to disclose little by little as we penetrate into this uh, mystery. To begin, observe that we place on the right graphic of this PDF the resurrected Christ in order to point that the living soul that the book of Genesis talk about is precisely related with the resurrection. And it is only possible to understand this by studying the tree of life and by studying the, the, the law of seven, which is the law that organizes. To begin, let us comprehend about the seven cosmoses, which we mentioned in other lectures and which are related to the tree of life. The first cosmos that is uh, related with the abstract absolute light of the absolute is what we call the ains of or. Or is light. That light or unites the ains of with the three sephiroths or the first triangle of the tree of life that are named Keter, Chokma, Bina. Plus the Ein Sof is the other He of the sacred name that is mentioned here, Yod He, Bav He, and that we explained in several lectures. That Or, or the Ein Sof Or, is that light that is named Yehida, and that we mentioned also in previous lectures. Yehida means unity in Hebrew. This Yehida of unity is pure light. When we talk about light, we talk about consciousness, intelligence, which is diluted as we explain in different lectures, in the space. It's a light that belongs to the seventh dimension. In Kabbalah, this Yehida is that light that in order to express its power, unfolds into another type of light that we explain is named Haya, which is life in Hebrew. So when we talk about Haya, we talk about that power of that light that expresses itself through the duality. <coughs> and uh, the duality is precisely what we explain in several lectures, in these uh, lectures of Genesis, how this Haya uh, is related with the name Elohim that encloses the name Elayam and El Hayam, the sea goddess and the sea god which are the two polarities of that Akashic force that channels the light of Yehida. 
that uh, Haya in different religions is named in different manners. In Kabbalah, uh, is named Abba in Aima, father, mother. In Hinduism, is called Shiva Shakti. In Christianity, in the esoteric uh, level, is called uh, Yosef and Mary, which represents, of course, the physical parents of Jesus of Nazareth. So, in Yehida, which is that universal unity of light, resides that which in Kabbalah is called the Messiah. So, the coming of the Messiah is something very profound and significant in Kabbalah that we have to understand here. Because only the Messiah is the one capable of doing the work that we are going to explain related with the seventh day. That light of Yehida has to descend through the light of Haya into the man that is already created. Like we explained that the true man is susceptible, has seven bodies. Those seven bodies are related with the seven lower sephiroths of the tree of life. These are named Chesed, Geburah, Tiferet, Nentzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malkut. If you count these seven bodies from the top to the bottom, so the seven becomes Malkut, which is the physical body. If you count them from the bottom to the top, then the seventh is Chesed, the spirit. In either way, we had to understand that in order to point the seventh. When we talk about the seven, we are talking about the true man. And of course, as you know, this true man came through the power of Elohim, the two polarities, or what we call Haya, life, which is precisely the sexual power in Yesod, sex, which Kabbalistically is called Shaddai El Hai, which means the almighty life of God. Or well, that is translated that the almighty God. But really, Chaya or Chai is life. And El is God. And Shaddai, the almighty one. So the almighty one, Shaddai El Chai, is precisely the one that works through sexuality. That's why when Moses was in the, in the Mount of Sinai, that power that talked to him through the burning bush said, I am the God of Abraham, he said, the God of Isaac, Geburah, and the God of Jacob, Tifereth. I appeared to them under the name of El Shaddai. But to you, I am appearing as Yod He Vav He, and this is my name forever. This is what in Kabbalah says Baruch Hashem, the holy name. So it is because Moses, that represents the causal body, is a true man that is going to pass to, through the process in order to enter into the world of Yehida. Or better said, in order to enter into the world of uh, Yetzirah through Yehida. You see these two words? 
are similar. But Yehida means unity. And Yetzirah means formation. And observed that he in the first uh, chapter of the seventh chapter, I mean seventh verse of the second chapter of the book of Genesis, states, And Yulhaba Elohim formed Adam. Doesn't say created. Form. Because the man is already created there and is going to continue his development right? within the womb of creation. So, this man of Yetzirah begins from Yesod. Because when we talk about Yetzirah, we are talking about the three main sephiroths, which are called Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. Those are the three sephiroths, or the, that triangle, related with the fourth dimension. Or better said, with the fourth and fifth dimensions in the tree of life. Because the man of Asia, which is Malkut, Precisely that uh, man that we talk in the sixth uh, uh, lecture related with the sixth day, which is uh, mingled with uh, impurity, with bestial forces that all of us have within. So, this Yod He Vav He, which is a unity that symbolizes the world of Yehira has to descend into the true man. When that light descends in the true man, that is physical body, vital body, astral body, mental body, causal body, beautic body, and atmic body, the seven bodies, then that light descends into the very center of the, of the tree of life, which is called Tifereth, the human soul. So that human soul receives what we call the Messiah, that light. That light from Yehida descends through Chaya, which is father, mother, and enters into the human soul, Tifereth, and then we have the Messiah incarnated into the true man. That's the descension, the descent of the Savior into the man. That is what is called the Son of Man. The Son of Man is named in the book of Ezekiel several times. And also in the Gospels, the four Gospels, talk about the Son of Man. We had to comprehend and to understand that this Son of Man is a mixture of two forces. One human and the other divine. The human is, of course, related with the seven bodies that we are, is already created. The human being is there, already created. But the divine is the Messiah, the Savior, that descends from the world of Yehida into the world of Haya, which, as you uh, remember, is related with Adam and Eve, Oava and Aima. Shiva Shakti, the two polarities of Bina, father-mother in each one of us. So then, this uh, light descends and becomes what we call the Savior incarnated, the Messiah, in the individual that is following the direct path. This Messiah has to perform his work 
in three days. It is worth it to mention <coughs> that the first day is also related with the creation of the bodies. But it is a uh, work that Christ performs as fire, as esh in Kabbalah. The work of the fire means the creation through the fire or the crystallization of the fire in the different unities that we explain, the astral body, the mental body, and the causal body, in order to rise all the seven serpents of fire. And that is, of course, a creation related with Christ as Inri, fire. But also the Lord has to make that man into the image of God, a living soul. And for that, he descends from, the, from Yehida into the very bottom of the tree of life, which is the world of Asia, related to the Sephira Malkut. Malkut, the world of Asia, is what the Gospels call the stable of Bethlehem. This stable of Bethlehem is a very physical body of the initiate. Why it is called stable? Because within this body, we have two types of animals, Kabbalistically speaking, that we talked in the previous lecture. Remes, the creeping thing, which is related with Lilith, and Behema, the cattle, which is related with Nahema. The two psychological moons that everybody has, and we have, Lilith and Nahema, the white and the black moon, that in the previous lecture we explained are related with Yesod, and Hod, with our own particular animality. Lilith and Naama, or Nahema, Kabbalistically it is stated, that were the two previous wives of Adam. And this is very significant, because if you observe the sequence of the creation of the man, of Adam, to these lectures, you understand that in the beginning you had to learn how to transmute your sexual energy. Because normally we fornicate as intellectual animals. The origin of fornication is Lilith. The origin of adultery is Nahema. And that is within. When the individual fornicates, automatically commits adultery. is adulterating, prostituting his own sexual matter. Because fornication belongs to animals. So everybody that comes into this path is a fornicator and adulterers. No exception. Because those forces, Lilith and Nahema, are normally in any animal of the kingdom, including the intellectual animal, as we, we were studying this. And of course, Lilith and Nahema belongs to the seventh cosmos. You read with the seventh cosmos, we explain that the first is the, the world of the ends of Or, then comes Atziluth, then comes Bria, then comes Yetzira, Asia, and then the cosmos that is already created 
which is a human being with the seven bodies. And the seventh, of course, relates to the bowels of the planet, the bowels of the earth, which is hell. And these bowels, related with hell, is what in Kabbalah is called klipoth, the cosmos of shells. And uh, klipoth is divided in two great spheres, the sphere of Lilith and the sphere of Nahemah. And that relates to our own particular subconsciousness, unconsciousness, infraconsciousness. No one escapes of having those spheres within. Lilith, I repeat, fornication. Nahema, adultery. So therefore, the Lord descends in order to transform that man into a true living soul. And his task is precisely to annihilate those moons, to transform those moons into gold, to transform the moon into a sun, or the vile metals into gold. And that is a process, a long process, that I repeat, only the Savior, only the Messiah can do it within the initiate. This is what commonly is called in the Bible, in the Gospels, the coming of the Savior, which, of course, in Hebrew is called Yeshua. If you add the letter Shin, that represents the fire of Yehira, between the four letters of yod he vav he and then you form the word Yeshua, which means Savior. The Bible is written in different manners, but this is the hidden Kabbalistic manner in which you understand how the Savior called Yeshua enters into the true man in order to perform the great work. Then he descends into Malkut, and from Malkut will start rising what we call the seven serpents of light. This light relates to Yehida, relates to the Messiah. Remember when we talk about Yehida, we are talking about the ends of Or, Keter, Chokmah, Bina, that form the sacred name of God. So this development of this light relates to the consciousness. Because light and consciousness is the same. If we want the light of Yehidah through the Messiah to develop inside of our consciousness, we have to work our consciousness. Because that light settles in the consciousness. That's why the light unites with Tifereth, which is the human soul, the causal body, the body of willpower within that that we call Moshe. And that's why this willpower called Moshe develops the light of Neshama, that in previous lecture we explained. This light of Neshama is the Tzalem. Within it is the Tzalem, the image of God in the monad, but not fully developed. So the work of the human soul, which is Moses, is to work on the direction of the Messiah, of the light of Yehira, in making the light within the initiate to shine little by little, bit by bit. And this is precisely the mystery of what we are saying here of the seventh day that we are explaining. If you remember, in the Gospels, they talk about Mary Magdalene. Who is this Mary Magdalene? Well, there are many theories about her. 
but we are going to talk about this Mary Magdalene in the archetypical manner. The woman, the master, existed, but she represents something within us. It is stated that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. If you observe the name, it has two mems, Mem, Mary Magdalene. That's to begin with. We wonder, who is this Mary Magdalene that uh, the Gospels talk about? Related with our own psychology? Well, it relates to those elements that we are talking about. Lilith and Ahema. That has to be transformed. Because the book of Revelation talks the whole of this humanity, the great whore, whose number is 666. We make the addition of 18. And if we cut 18 in two halves, we have two nines. Two yesods. Two types of sexualities that the beast has and develop with, which are precisely Lilith and Nahema, because these two sexualities express themselves through Yesod, which is sexuality. And that's why is 9 plus 9 is 18, which means the 6666. This whore expresses itself through the three brains, because 6 relates to the human soul. Six through the mind, through the heart, and to the sex. That's the whole whore, which is inside of everybody. Nobody escapes all this. This is what we have to do, to understand and comprehend. The Messiah descends. But in order for the Messiah to work, there has to be a repented prostitute. Remember that the Messiah comes in order to save this, the sinner. But if we start boasting about being saints, but the Lord says, well, how are we going to save a saint? I only saved sinners. So first, we have to acknowledge that prostitution, adultery, fornication exists inside of us. To acknowledge that and to repent but not verbally. As the ordinary people say that they raise the, the arm and says, I acknowledge my sins and accept the Lord as my savior. So easy. No. That means that you have to acknowledge that through meditation because the Lord is light and your consciousness is bottled up into that prostitution. Observe the Gospels. It says, it is stated that the Lord, the Savior, the Messiah, took seven defects out of Mary Magdalene in order to make her holy. And she was an adulteress. So, Think about that archetype and visualize and understand that that adultery is not in the past. It's here in our psyche. We have to acknowledge this adultery and this fornication in us and to work in order to follow the Lord, which is chastity. Because this is how the Lord that is pure in the world of Yehida descends and become impure, mingle with the darkness, but in order to save us. That's precisely the great sacrifice that we have to understand and comprehend. So this uh, Mary Magdalene, or this prostitute, this adulteress, is the one that enters and is with his tears. Washing the feet of the Lord and pouring nard perfume on his feet. That, of course, is a very profound symbol of 
Malkut. Because when we visualize a tree of life, Malkut relates to our feet. To clean the feet with tears of the Lord is making Malkut, the physicality, pure. Because within Malkut is Klipoth, which is Lilith and Nahema. And that adulteress that is kneeling and crying at the feet of the Messiah is acknowledging it. But not as a hypocrite. It's acknowledged it through meditation to comprehension. That or those elements related. And is repenting. That re repent is in process. And of course relates to the perfume of nard. Nard is the perfume of the sixth dimension. Nard belongs to Tifereth. And of course Tifereth relates to the son of man. Jesus represents the son of man. Christ united with the human soul. Beautiful. Of course, when the, the multitudes that ignore these facts listened to this doctrine and examined the life of the great initiates, they start criticizing those individuals, cavalists that presume of being chaste, or that presume of sanctity. It's called the hypocritical Pharisees. They observe that this prostitute or this adulteress is at the feet of the Messiah, and they say, if this man really, truly was a prophet, he will recognize that that woman is a sinner, an adulteress. And of course, they don't understand that. They don't understand that the first that recognizes the resurrection of the Lord is Mary Magdalene. As it is written. Because Mary Magdalene and Jesus of Nazareth form a symbiosis. A symbiosis that make a God, an Elohim, knowing good and evil. Because all that evil which is in that prostitute, in that adulteress, is being transformed with the light. And making an Elohim of the initiate, knowing good and evil. So we all hear how the Lord, it is stated, descends into hell in order to work. But first, the Lord has to own the initiate has to rise as light in the physical body, in the vital body, in the astral body, in the mental body, in the causal body, in the beauty body, in the atmic body. Once he is risen as light within the seven bodies of the initiate, he is accomplishing only the first day of what the book of Genesis talk about. Let us go into the second uh, wait, 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 the second graphic. We find here a beautiful image of Quan Yin that we related with Neshama because this Neshama is precisely the divine soul with, that, will, that will develop with the help of Avalokiteshvara 
with the help of Christ, Quan Yin, or what, however you want to name it, Vishnu incarnated in the initiate. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27, we read, The candle, which is Yehirah, the light of Yehirah, of Yod Hava, which is the name, second name of God in Yehirah, is Neshama, which is the image, the Tzalem, which is in the monad, in the spirit. That's why it says, is Neshama of Adam, searching for all the inward parts of his belly. Because the different parts of Neshama are in the belly. What is the belly? The belly is the womb. The belly is the entrails of the earth. The earth is this planet earth. And it's also the philosophical earth, which is our physicality. Because here in this area of the belly, we have our sexual appetites related with the first wives of Adam. Understand that. Because before Adam receiving Eve as his twin soul, he was previously having sexual intercourse with Lilith and Ahima. Kabbalistically, we will say that in the beginning we had to work with Lilith and Ahima, extracting the fire from them in order to create the human being into us. Because we don't know yet the first initiate that enters into this path with our ego. Everybody enters into this path with ego. And everybody has to learn how to teach the donkey, the physical body, to be chased. Because the donkey, the physical body, is a behema, fornicates. So to teach the physicality to transmute it's a great task of transforming Nahema, physically speaking. But that transformation is not only physical, it has to be in all the 49 levels of the mind. But first, of course, when we acquire chastity in the physical body, we continue doing that and giving different steps, initiations, in order to create the man, in order to rise the serpents of light together with willpower which remember willpower is Moses and then we have to this is how we work in what we call the exodus the living of this animal level into the divine level by collecting all the parts of Neshama, where we find the image of God in the monad, our own particular unity. That's why in the third graphic, you find the quotation of Matthew 12, verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the core, the hell of the earth. When people read this, they associate that with Master Jesus of Nazareth that came 2,000 years ago. And they are right, because he did that. But not only him, every single initiate has to descend into the core of the earth, which is our own particular subconsciousness, infraconsciousness, unconsciousness. Because there is where the consciousness is trapped. So the Lord descends, and as you see there in the graphic, to liberate, as uh, the scripture says, the soul of Abraham, the first patriarchs, the soul of Adam, the soul of this and that, archetypes which are trapped within the ego and that he needs to liberate. And that's precisely Master Samael on the or states, 
All the work that is written in the book of Genesis is synthesized in three days. Of course, all the initials know that. That's why Moses synthesized also all the works of Genesis in three days. We find the next uh, graphic. The next graphic, uh, uh, the fourth, right? Where we explained also, again, the mysterious word of Genesis, the first, which is called Bereshith, which is translated as in the beginning. By modifying the letters of Bereshith, we form the word Aire. Shabbat. Aire means to fear or to venerate. And Shabbat, well, is the Shabbat, the seventh day. To venerate the seventh day, or in other words, is written, by venerating the seventh day, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. And then, and the heavens and the air were finished, and all the host of them, which is the first verse of the second chapter, which is explained. The heavens and the earth relate, of course, to the superior bodies of the men, the heavens, and the earth is the physicality. It's the first verse of the second chapter. But by explaining Bereshit in this manner, by venerating Shabbat, Elohim created the heavens of the earth. We have to understand then that the veneration of the physical body is indispensable. It is not that we are going to have a photo of our physical body and to worship it. Means to venerate the forces which are in the body, which is the seventh. Because Chesed is the first from the top, and then Geburah, the second, Tiferet, the third, Netzach, the fourth, the fifth, Hod, the sixth, Yesod, and the seventh is Malkut. And Malkut is our own particular individual prostitute. I'm sorry to, to be so cruel in this way to point you, but that is the truth. We prostitute the sexuality. We are children of Lilith and Nahema. And we want to renounce because that principle that is called Adam inside of us is renouncing that little by little. This is our own particular Mary Magdalene, our own physicality that we have to transform. And then the Lord enters and start transforming it in making the heavens and the earth and all the host of them. The Zohar states, it's already there that we publish it, that the heaven and the earth relates, of course, to all the world of creation that we have as, as, a, as an Adam, as a true man, the internal bodies and the physicality. And the host of them Refer, of course, to those individuals that achieved perfection. The host of heaven. We call it the gods or the angels. And every god, every angel in heaven developed objective reasoning. Objective reasoning is the reasoning that allowed us to comprehend Kabbalah and alchemy that we have to develop in different scales. So all the lights that you see, the hosts in heaven, stars, planets, are the vehicle of one particular light that achieved that. So Har says, the different interpretations of this knowledge 
relates to the host of heaven. Because in heaven we find all of these great beings that achieve that perfection. And each one of them gave the knowledge, interpreted the knowledge, Kabbalistically, in his own level. We are starting the level of Moses. You study the Pisces Sophia is another level. So different hosts. The Quran, written or dictated by Muhammad, is another type of Kabbalistic alchemical book according to his own level. So the different interpretations of this knowledge, of this science, is written in many books by many masters in this planet. And in any planet. That means that the science of Kabbalah is perfect. And expresses itself in the universe. Here in the earth, we know it through the Bible, to the Quran, to the Bhagavad Gita, to the Mahabharata. All of these books written in this planet Earth. But in other planets with other humanities, they might have the books, their science, their philosophy, related always with the same thing. Because they are the creation of the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them. That means that what people think, oh, if we discover other humanities, the Bible we will, will be worthless. No. Why? What is written in the Bible is Kabbalistic and, al and al alchemical statements that are good in any planet of the universe because relate to the light and will match any philosophy, any religion, any science in any planet or this galaxy or any other galaxy in the universe. So this is how we understand this and comprehend it. Because the whole knowledge emerges from the rottenness of our psyche. Remember that in Hinduism you find in Buddhism also the symbol of the uh, lotus flower. Beautiful. But receives its nourishment from the sur, or how you call that, uh, the mud of the earth. And is what uh, uh, the book of Genesis says. And God formed Adam from the dust of the earth. Because that dust, is the, that mud, that clay is mingled with all the archetypes. That we have to clean and purify with the signs of alchemy. These three days that we are talking about, and the Master Samael mentioned in his books that all the book of Genesis is synthesized in three days, Moses also stated that in the three, seven days. First he says, and on the seventh day Elohim ended his work which he had made. And then he says, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified because that in it he had rested from all his work which Elohim created and made. You see? But he is Kabbalistically is talking about these three days in which the whole science is synthesized. But Moses related to the seventh day. Why? Because each day ends with the seventh. It's a process of the true human being that has seven bodies. For instance, we find what the Sohar says, or what the Master says. In the next uh, graphic, we quoted the Master Samael on Veor. He said, These three days are allegorical. Sequentially, the Son of Man that has the Lord incarnated passes through three great purifications. At the end of these three days, even the endmost human element that was in his interior dies. This is why it is said that the Son of Man has died in himself. He has killed death because death can only be killed with death. Then the Son of Man has to resurrect with the physical body. 
Then he is resurrected master, a resurrected master with the elixir of longevity. He is the true king of nature in accordance to the order of Melchizedek. Then we can exclaim as the apostle Paul exclaims, death is swallowed up in victory. Or death, where is thy sting? Or grave, where is thy victory? This means something very important here that we need to understand. Because there are many ignoramuses who call themselves Gnostics and state that immediately that you start practicing the sexual magic, the arcanum, or you reach the mastery, and then you receive the elixir of, of longevity. And this is really ludicrous. Because when somebody reaches the fifth initiation of Mary Mysteries, it still has the Litin Nahema within. It will be absurd to give immortality uh, to this type of being. The elixir of longevity that the Master talks about, let us understand it, relates to the last step. When the master resurrects from his own ashes, when he enters into the fourth dimension, which is the world of Yetziah, then he receives the elixir of longevity because he has no ego. The gods, the masters, will not be fools to give the elixir of longevity to a person like us, even if we have the solar bodies. So therefore, the physical body has to die, has to fight for a transformation. People always think that the resurrection of the Lord is three-dimensional. No, it's tetra-dimensional. Because the world of formation, the forming of Adam is in Yetzirah. Asia means to make, to create, which is Malkut. But all of this work, of course, is a transformation. When an individual achieves this resurrection, he no longer belongs to this three-dimensional world because this Malkut three-dimensional world, physical body, is fallen. It's a sephira that is fallen. A resurrected matter doesn't belong to a fallen sephira. It belongs to Yesod, which is related to the true man, the man of formation. Then he receives the power of medicine and the elixir of long life. Before that, no. I remember, for instance, an uh, anecdote that happened with me and the Master Samael on Veor. He was coming to the north of Mexico. I was teaching there and I uh, organized a lecture for him. But then I phoned him and I said, Master, we collected now and we have uh, the ticket for the airplane for your flight to this city. And he says, well, I need another ticket for the Master Litelantes. She has to come with me. Okay, we will collect also. In the north of Mexico, it's not easy to make collections in order to pay the ticket, you know, of airplane. But we made it. We received him in the airport. And then after that, talking amiably in the house, we said, Master, what do you travel in the fourth dimension, in genus state, like the Master uh, Faust that was traveling and going from one city to the other? And then in that, uh, we uh, save this trouble of collecting money because it's really... And he says, well, he says, right now, I cannot. Because Master Faust is a resurrected master. And he, of course, was traveling in the fourth dimension because he had that power. He was already a resurrected master at that time. I am not a resurrected master yet. That level, of course. Because he was a resurrected master in the light. He was a resurrected master in the fire. But physically speaking, he was not. He says, no, I cannot. But the next year, because we were talking in 1977, I will receive the elixir of longevity. I will receive the red carbuncle, the philosophical stone. And then the, 
we will do many things, but in secrecy. We will assist this humanity in other ways. But right now, this is what we had. We had travel in airplane or in car. And then I understood more the science. He was true. He was not, he was finishing the third day. You see, the third day he was finishing. But there are many people that not understand this, and they'll study uh, the books of the Master just like uh, when they're reading a newspaper. They don't understand that there is a little longevity, and et cetera, et cetera, is acquired after the third day. Not the first, not the second, the third. And of course, during that process, you have to pay what you owe. And with, what is what you owe? Fornication and adultery. Nobody escapes. <coughs> Not even the Master Jesus of Nazareth escaped that. Remember that it is stated that he was married to Mary Magdalene. In this case, of course, represent his own wife. But in his physicality, represented, of course, the defects and vices that he was working with in order to purify himself at a higher level. That is represented in many ways. See, before going into that, let us go into the next graphic, number seventh, in order to understand the first day. The Zohar states, and on the seventh day, El Hayam, well, I put there Narayana, because it's the god of the, of the ocean in Hinduism, ended his work which she, the goddess of the sea, had made, which is the Divine Mother. These words signify the traditional law, which is the foundation, the assault of the world, Malkut. The work which she, Elayam, has made is Asya. It is not said all her work because she, because the written law, Dharma, which emanated through Hohma, wisdom, Krishna, was not included in it. Hohma, remember, is the second logos, led to the world of Yehida. So when you start making the work of alchemy, of initiation, you have to deal with the first law, or the traditional law, karma. Every initiate walks the path according to his own karma. In which way we fornicated in this life and previous lives, you only know by yourself. What type of adultery you committed in this life and in past lives, only you know that. So the type of Kamaduro and Karmazaya that we have is different. That's why it is absurd to try to imitate physically an initiate step by step. We imitate the internal path related with the Lord, which is written in the Gospels. But the physical body of every initiate, physical life, relates to their own karma. And we cannot imitate every step because we have different karma. For instance, the karma that I have is different from the karma that the master had. And I am walking in this path according to my own particular karma, which relates to Kamaduro and Karmazaya, adultery and fornication. Because from those two roots, Lilith and Nehema, emerge all the ego, all the psychology that I have, that you have, and that everybody has. And this is something that we have to understand. We have to pay this in steps, little by little. And that's precisely karma. But when the Lord descends and unites with Arjuna, Moses, the human soul, then Dharma is mingled with it. Dharma is the higher law. Remember this. The law, Dharma, is the law that teaches us 
how to walk on the light. Don't mistake that law with your own particular karma. But that law mingle with our own law, karma, in order to make of us something different. Dharma is purity. Dharma is the light of Yehida. But sacrifices itself with our own karma in order to transform us. That mixture is what only the initiates that walk in the direct path understand. Because Dharma is a law that controls the inferior law, or what the Master Samael said. The superior law, Dharma, washes away the inferior law, Karma. In this manner, we understand what we're talking about. So, the first day, relates with the creation of the human being inside of us according to our own particular individual karma and relates also to the incarnation of the Lord if we take the direct path with the serpents of light. Once that step is finished, then we have to say, and the Lord finished his creation in the seventh day. Because all the fuel that we took in order to create, in order to incarnate the Lord, is taken from the physical body. The physical body has to trans pass through a transformation. And this is explained in different parts of the Bible and other myths. For instance... Let us go into the next day, or we will say into the graphic number eight. Look at this beautiful picture that we have there. Paris and Helen. Do you know the story of Paris and Helen? It's a beautiful myth. Of course, the whole thing is what? Adultery? Because Helen was the wife of Menelaus. And this is written that there was going to be a great wedding where all the gods were assisted. Or assisting, I mean. Invited, except one. The goddess of discord. So she was just very upset and she threw a golden apple into the wedding. And then the golden, says, the golden apple said to the fairest Fair, fair, fairest of the beauty, of the most beautiful god of the Olympus. And then Era says, I, this is apple is for me. At, Athena says, no, this is for me. And then Aphrodite says, no, this is for me. They were just fighting because each one of them belongs to be the most beautiful. And then says, let Zeus said, who is the most beautiful? Then Zeus says, I am not going to follow that Mistake, <laughs> that will be a big trouble. Let us, Paris, let Paris, the most beautiful man on the earth, decide who of you is the most beautiful. And then Hermes descended and talked with, with Paris that was really a, a shepherd. You see the symbol there, shepherd? That brings me to my memory. David, the shepherd. Moses, the shepherd. And all those shepherds. So Paris, of course, was working was an initiate. Somebody that was taking nefesh, the animal soul, and transforming it into beauty. So was a beautiful man, Adam. A beautiful man. So the three goddesses arrive, and who of us is the most beautiful? And then it is stated that they took all their clothes out and were naked in front of him. And then Paris saw the three naked goddesses, which are representation, of course, of the Divine Mother, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Aphrodite. Beautiful symbol. To see the goddess naked is to know the truth, hidden behind the veil. And then says, 
is difficult because all of you are beautiful. Bribe me with something and I will decide. Then Era says, I will give you Asia and Europe as your kingdom. Then Athena says, I will teach you how to be a great warrior and to fight against your own defects and vices. And then Aphrodite says, I will give you the most beautiful woman in the world whose name is Helen. Of course, she didn't say that was Mary. And uh, that was the development of the world of Troy that everybody knows. Because uh, he accepted uh, the bribe of uh, Aphrodite. And then the, the problem was resolved. And of course, he, he gained uh, Helen of Troy. That's a symbol of the divine soul. Did Helen of Troy exist? Yes, she existed. Does Mary Magdalene exist? Or did, did Mary Magdalene exist? Yes. All of these women existed. But they're symbols that these great uh, individuals took in order to symbolize what we are talking about here. Helen of Troy is within us. The divine soul, Neshama. And of course, uh, the trouble there is that Paris go and takes what he want rightly and make the big war. That big war had to ex also happen to us. The Mahabharata, the great work. In the Bible is written in different ways that we have to understand. It is written that uh, there were two lustful Kabbalists that were looking at Shoshana that was the wife of another man. And they wanted to possess her. And were trying to possess her by, by force. Threatening her. You know that is an apocryphal book. Called Shoshana. In which she was unjustly accused by these two men. Because she refused. And uh, she was uh, accused of being with a young guy. And having sex with it. While her husband was traveling. Was a big lie, which hides the meaning of what we're talking about here. Those people that long for Neshama, for the divine soul, for the spiritual soul to be incarnated on all the powers and all the virtues, but being lustful? No way. Shoshana, Neshama, will not enter into a lustful person. This person has to be a Paris. As you said, Paris or Paris, right? A handsome guy that is not physically handsome, but relates to his physicality because he is Malkut. And Malkut, as we said in all the lectures, refers to Nefesh. Nefesh is the animal soul. That re represented in, of this Nefesh animal soul in the Bible is David. David the king that kills, as you know, Goliath. And that's why uh, the people at that time says, Sheol, or Saul, killed 1,000. But David, he is 10,000. I mean that he was already in the tree of life, working profoundly. He was, of course, a great king, controlling Nefesh, Malkut. And it is written that also he was looking at Neshama. But this Neshama was not Shushana or Neshama or Helen, but his name was Beth Sheba. And she was bathing as well as Shushana. And he was looking at her from the balcony. And she married her, and she was married to Uriah. That was the name of her, of her husband. Written Aor Ja. Or light, the light of Jah, in other words, hides the name of Uriah. Because they're written with Aleph, Bab, Resh, Hey, Va, uh, Hav, I mean, Hey, Yod, Uriah, the wife of the light. And all that, of course, is a mysterious development 
או האו נפש, the soul in the physicality, is marrying little by little, נשמה, או גבורה, the divine soul. And the first step is precisely that. What the Zohar explains. In the book of Reyeva, the aged and venerable, this also refers to the jubilee, sexual joy, and is therefore followed by the words from all of his works, from, for from the second day, you saw the lower waters, everything was produced and brought forth. Means the union, the second day is Yesod. The waters of Yesod, when they are mingled, between, the, I mean, in the sexual alchemy, produce what we call this symbiosis of nefesh with neshama. It's a work of alchemy in which the initiate marry the beautiful Helen, or marry Shushana, which are all the archetypes of neshama, or Bathsheba. Between parentheses, Bat Sheva means the daughter of the seven. Sheva is seventh, and Bat is daughter. Of which seven is she a daughter? If you count the seven bodies of the man, and you extract the psyche, the soul from those seven bodies in the process of purification of alchemy, that extractum is Neshama, is Bat Sheva, the daughter of the seven bodies. Mainly, of course, the seventh, which in this case is Malkut. And that's why it is uh, written in the second day, as you can uh, read the uh, Of these three days are here. The first day says, And on the seventh day Elohim ended his work which he had made. That's the first day. The work that he has made, of course, is sexual. The creation of the bodies. And the rising of the seven serpents of light and seven serpents of fire. That's the first ending. The second is, And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made. That second day relates to the wedding of David with Bathsheba. Because the initiate has to annihilate <coughs> all of those defects related with prostitution, adultery, and fornication of the 96 last, as we explained in the previous lecture. And then he enters into a process of development of the seven purgatorial steps. In order for that Bet Sheva, daughter of the seven, to be united physically with him, to be incarnated. And of course, this is a long process in which the initiate has to work in meditation very profoundly in order to to acquire that. That's why you find in the graphic there, the graphic of William Blake, the seventh, which is precisely symbolized by Eve. Because remember that Eve was created in the seventh day, because she represents the seven, the female aspect of the initiate, and also the sexual force of the initiate, which is in Malkut, his physicality, or her physicality. And then it's written, And Elohim blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which Elohim created and made. In the third day, we had to acquire sanctification. Complete, 
pure purity of the psyche. And that is represented for the last day related with the book of Job in which the initiate is annihilating those very dark parts of Lilith which are hidden in his own psyche. But first he has to incarnate in his physicality that Geburah. The incarnation of Geburah in the physical body that is part of the monad, which is called the divine soul, is not completely incarnated, but by steps. Is what we have to understand. When the initiate finishes the second day, he incarnates the divine soul. But that divine soul, parts of it, are bottled up within more ego. And little by little is developing, freeing all of those parts of the divine soul in order to completely unite and to make of it that entity which is called Eve, knowing good and evil. Because remember that Eve relates to the left side of the tree of life. The making of Eve is something that is a process of alchemy within each one of us. That Eve has to be the structum of all the psychological, alchemical work that we do inside of us. Because here we are only explaining how the initial has to finish with the three days. And in each day he has to rest. But in order to rest, he has to reach the seventh. Seven serpents of light, first day. Then the seven aspects of uh, Yetzirah, the second day. And the third day is another seven that when Inisha reaches that level, he enters into his holy sepulcher and passes for all of that. Remember that it's written that Jesus of Nazareth descended into hell and three days after he resurrected. It's written in the book of Jonah because he said as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, likewise, the Son of Man has to be three days and three nights. Those three days are the three aspects of the Shabbat that we are explaining here. As you see, to rest doesn't mean that as long as reaches this Saturday, you go and you sit and drink coffee and do nothing. Just following literally the, the, the Sabbath. But if we understand this psychological, alchemical work, we have to understand there are three Shabbats or three seven days that the book of Genesis talk about. We have to accomplish the first one, which is the creation of the bodies. The second day, which is the incarnation of the monad in the initiate. And the third day, which is the incarnation of Binah the third aspect of the Logos. Because this incarnation happens in process. In the third day, the initiate has to be swallowed by the serpent. That serpent is the Divine Mother, Aima Elohim. She doesn't eat refuse. She doesn't eat garbage. She doesn't eat filth. Only purify. So when the initial is purifying his bodies in the third day, the Divine Mother, who is symbolized by a serpent, is swallowing body by body in each step. And of course, 
when the initial is completely swallowed, when the Divine Mother swallowed his seven bodies, then he is called a serpent, a naga of the third day, but it still is not finished. Because remember that Haya, the divine light of Bina, the Holy Spirit, is divided in two forces. The Divine Mother and the Divine Father. Shiva Shakti. So Shakti, the divine serpent, swallows first. And then the eagle comes and swallows the serpent. That is the symbol of the flag in the, Me in the Mexican flag. It's a symbol of, of alchemy. The eagle swallowing the serpent means the Holy Spirit swallowing the Divine Mother in order to make a Quetzalcoatl, a living soul of that initiate. And that happens in the eighth day. Eighth. According, of course, to the third day, because the third day is synthesized in eight. Meaning that after the Divine Mother swallowed all the bodies, and that man is completely, or will be said, half divine, then the eagle, which is Shiva, the Holy Spirit, starts swallowing that individual, all the seven bodies, which are one, and the individual, of course, here in the physical body, suffers terrible pains when the eagle is swallowing it. And that is symbolized by the crucifixion of the Lord on the cross. Father, Father, why are you forsaking me? And he's suffering terrible pains. The lance of Longevous piercing his side symbolizes the belly where he has to purify. And the cross is how he is paying adultery and fornication. That's the last step. That's the third day in order to completely rest, as he says there, sanctify it in the seventh day and sanctify it. He bless it and sanctify it. To receive the bless of God and to sanctify the seventh day, which is the physical body, is resurrection. But in order for the, the physical body to be swallowed, is atom by atom, little by little. And that, of course, is the last step. But before that is how the initiate is paying what he owes. The adultery with Helen, the adultery with Beshela. He wants to absorb completely the divine soul. And when that is achieved, all the divine soul, the androgynous Adam, is made in the third day, not before. So we have here the number nine that says, the third expression in El Hayam, blessed the seventh day, relates to the high priest, Chesed, the Ruach Elohim, who blessed, blesses all the world of Malkut and has the preeminence in all things, as we learn from tradition, that in all offerings, the high priest, Aaron Chesed, receives the principal part from Malkut, his seventh body, which is called Elisheva. You see the word there, again there? Sheva, seven. That was the name of the wife of Aaron. Eli means my God. And Sheva means the instructum of the divine soul. For a priest, Chesed, that is represented in Aaron to be married to Elisheva, that means a lot of work in us. Purification, sanctity, but true, not sanctimonious, 
not to claim that I am holy, to acquire that holiness within by annihilating Lilith and Nahema. There is no other way. Only when with atom of Lilith inside of Nahema, we are not pure, but impure. And see now, for instance, in the number 10, remember that he said, we explained that he said in the Bible is represented by Abraham, represented by Aaron. But he said is the spirit, Abraham, the father of the high. And it's written, these are the generations, archetypes of the heavens and of the earth in the day when Abraham, Jehovah Elohim, was made by, by Jehovah Elohim and Abraham, the earth and the heavens. And all the hosts of them. You find there, for instance, this uh, graphic of Abraham when he was visited by three angels. These three angels are the three archetypes of Keter, Chokmah, Binah that are related with him because he is Chesed. And the three primary forces, Ketejo, Mabina, represented by three, these three angels, help the building of the work of the sanctification of Abraham, which is our own, the priest, which is Hesed, in the third day. And for that, what happened? Sodom and Gomorrah has to be burned. You see the other, the other symbol, that that we have within. Then in the other graphic, we find uh, the same uh, statement of the second chapter of the book of Genesis, when explained that again the same generations. Those generations are related, of course, with all the worlds that we see here, Atziluth, Bria, Yatsira, and Asia, in which we have to work alchemically, cabalistically, in order to develop the men of the seventh day. But remember, Adam, the man of the seventh day, relates with three days, three aspects in which we have to rest our work on Malkut. Because Malkut is the seventh. Malkut represents also the woman. Physically speaking, our physicality is Malkut, but between men and woman, the woman is more Malkut. That's why when we address the woman, we are addressing the seventh. And that's why Eve was created in the seventh. In the seventh day is when Jehovah Elohim put Adam to, to sleep. Right? And why was what he, he does after that? He says, he took one of his ribs. Right? But you think, oh, he took one of the ribs of Adam. No. He took one of his ribs, which is Eve, the divine forces, because it was already made the work there, and brought it to Adam. That Eve is one of the ribs of the Holy One, of God, that Adam didn't respect. That's why when Adam fornicated with Eve, it is stated that he called it an incest, adultery, fornicator. Because he was using Eve, which was the side of the rib of God, in the wrong way. And it's because the woman contains the feminine aspect of Jod Chava. And at this, you find uh, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we translated that according to Kabbalah. And Yod Chava Elohim, in Adam's feminine libido, the dust, mana of the ground, breatheth into his nostrils, his living spirit, and Yehi in Adam became a living soul. 
This is how you read, when you read all of the letters here in Hebrew, how that is hidden there. The word Yetzirah, or Yetzirah, means libido, sexual drive, right? Lebido. Yeah, lebido. The lebido is the sexual drive that is on the, on the ground, is in the man, which is also the dust or mana. You find this word here, see, mem nun, in the third uh, uh, line above of the Hebrew letters, you find the word mem nun. That is called mana which is that force that the Israelites were taking in the wilderness in order to feed themselves. That manna is a sexual force. The libido, in other words, of the ground. The ground is a physicality. When you take that libido from your physicality, from your own ground, which is called Adama in Hebrew, you are feeding your soul. That's called sexual alchemy. And after doing that process, you see there all the transformation of the ten Sephiroth in Adam. And Adam became a living soul. And this is how, after the seventh month, after the waters rose very high, the Ark of Noah rested in the Mount Ararat. In the seventh month. Same meaning. And of course... When the individual is completely formed with no ego, no Lilith, no Nahema, and then as that he is placed in the Garden of Eden. And Yodhava Elohim planted the garden eastward in Eden, and there they put Adam, whom they, the Divine Mother and the Divine Father, had formed. You see the beautiful picture there of the white Tara in Buddhism represents, of course, the androgenism, male, female, in the beautiful Garden of Eden. There is where you find that Adam as a living soul. That's why when we hear people talking about that they are living souls as individuals made into the image of God, we just feel sad because we understand that they don't even know what they're talking about. There are people that think that because they were born in a certain race that they think that they are made into the image of God and the rest who are not from that race are different. Image of God, only those that have no ego, that reach the third step of the seventh day, according to the book of uh, Genesis, where are completely sanctified, purified. Those are the individuals that are made into the image of God and are living souls. Jesus is one, represented by his own resurrection. Buddha, remember that Moses disappeared in the Mount Neville. What happened with him? After that, he entered into the world of Bina. Because Moses belonged to the world of Bina. As an androgynous. He enters into the fourth dimension. But uh, when he was seeing the fourth dimension, he still was not prepared to enter in it. Because Yodhavah told him, look, the promised land, but you will not enter in it yet. And all of us as well, through the development of this uh, doctrine, we can experience the fourth dimension. Enter into a state and to see the Elysian paradises. But it doesn't mean that we belong to it. We can see at it. If we want to be a citizen, of the promised land, the citizen of, citizen of Eden, we have to pass through the three transformations, the three days, or the three Shabbats. And then we can enter 
then we can say death is conquered with death as Paul of Tarsus states and the only one that know, we know right now that entering into that, that state is the Master Samael on Veor he entered into Eden into the fourth dimension into the promised land in 1978 when he incarnated Bina within him because only he or she who has Bina incarnated can enter into the promised land which is Yesod because Yesod is controlled governed by Bina and like that enters into what we call the three or the third mountain please do not mistake the three mountains with the three days even though they are related but the first mountain is related with the first day and the second mountain relates to the second and third day this is two mountains that you you have to conquer so when you enter into the third mountain which is the incarnation of Chochmah Keter, and so or and so and all the levels above, you have to have within Bina incarnated. You have to be as in the esotericism we state. You say we have to be a gentle man. A gentle man is a man that incarnated Bina, the Holy Spirit in his resurrection do we have questions so in order to resurrect um, the ego has to be 100 percent dead to resurrect physically you, you have to be 100 percent dead but there are uh, physically dead but there are multiple levels of resurrection like you said master samael was resurrected at other levels but in order to fully resurrect you have to die physically. Yeah. There are many types of resurrection. When somebody conquers the uh, initiations of fire, it is stated he is resurrected in fire. When somebody uh, conquers the serpents of light, he says he is resurrected in the light. But in order to achieve the resurrection of the seventh day, which is called a living soul, you have to die completely in all the levels because if there is no death there is no resurrection right obviously you die in certain level in the fire that's why you resurrect in the fire but it still is ego there you resurrect in the light in a certain level but it still is ego there but when the resurrection of in the body happens you are completely dead 100% physically too, of course, because the physical body that we have work was created through fornication, we all know that our father, physical father and physical mother fornicated and created this body so it's a, it's a simple body, it's a prostitute it's an a, a adulterous body, so we have to transform that and sanctify it but that sanctification means death without death, there is no sanctification Mm -hmm. which is the three named Yaldabaoth, which is basically the, is that how the first, point, is that like the first fornication, which is the psychological process that takes place? Yeah, obviously everything comes from the light. Barbello uh, represents also Yehida, another light that unfolds and goes down into the physical body, into the physicality, the planet, and that we take, and unfortunately because we are intellectual animals, we fornicate, so that light creates something ominous but by following the doctrine is how we transform that ominous thing into a pure thing that is what is called Yaldabaoth is precisely the representation of that impure light that we have within which is the infrared light created with clipoth 
And this is something that we have to understand. When we relate to the demiurgus, relate to the animal level, we have to go out of the demiurgus in order to transform the animal into human. And that's a long step. The demiurgus is the one that channels the light in either way. The demiurgus can help you to transform the light in a positive manner. But if you decide to go into the left side, the lunar way, the demiurgus will assist you too because everything is light. Matter is energy, energy is matter. Those people that uh, decide to go to the lunar path, they go and sink into Klipoth, where the demiurgus will eat them. That demiurgus is fire. But if we want, we can do it here and allow the demiurgus to eat us in a positive manner. You see that? This is something that we have to understand and comprehend in meditation. Yeah? So in the, in the, the myth of Paris, the, the three goddesses represent uh, different aspects of the divine mother. Um, what is Hera and what is the significance of the gift of Europe? Hera is the wife of Zeus. We would say Hera and Zeus represent in this way uh, Haya, the two polarities, the higher level, right? Because they are related with creation. Of course, Zeus has all the representation, but in that way, Zeus and Hera is Shiva Shakti. And then Athena, of course, represents that a part of, of we would say, of Neshama that develops there. And Aphrodite relates, of course, to the physicality and all of those forces that could, could go in the, either way. Because Venus, Aphrodite, is uh, polarized in different manners. You know, Nahema is Aphrodite, but in the negative manner. And what is Hera's gift of Europe and Asia? The what? The gift, the bribe. The bribe. The well, uh, well uh, this is a symbol, of course, so something spiritual that uh, you will acquire, we will say that uh, when the initiate is identified with powers and dignities, he enters into the spiral path, and then you can be uh, the king of Asia, of Asia, in other words, right, the physical world, and Europe, Europa. Yeah. God appears to Abraham, Isaac, and, and Joseph as El Shaddai is because that's the beginning of the monad, the work with the monad. You see, the monad is Hesed, Geburah, and Tifereth, the three aspects of the letter Shin. So in the beginning, you work with El Shaddai, the sexual power, in order to create. But when you create inside of you your own Moses, your causal body, then you see the source of El Shaddai, which is above in that. And this says, I appear to the inferior levels of your psyche to El Shaddai. But now, because you are taking the direct path and you decided to go to Egypt to liberate the other parts of Neshama, which is Israel, then my name will be Yod Chava. Because part of Yehida, which is the light, the divine light of the cosmos, will enter into you. And that's the mixture that Master Jesus of Nazareth called the Son of Man. What are Joseph and Mary related to us? Joseph and Mary related to us. What are they? Archetypes. Mary is, of course, we explain that many lectures, Maria. Maria, in uh, Aramaic, means Maria, or Yah, the Lord Yah. That is Mary, the Lord Yah. In other words, means that Yah, Chochma, Christ, expresses itself through the physicality called Maria, thanks to Joseph. And Joseph is Eo Cephas. Cephas means stone. Eo is the duality. 
of the sexual force in Yesod. So when that sexual force of Yosefas, Joseph, in Yesod, is united with Maria, physically, as we are explaining here in this lecture, then the outcome is, of course, a great prophet, a great initiate that incarnates the Messiah, naming him Jesus of Nazareth, or Krishna, or however we want. He's always representing the same thing. What qualifications must we reach, if any, to enter Gen State? Can we reach Gen State before the third day? Because your story about how I always can do this. Okay. That's a good question. <clears throat> what do we need in order to enter into the fourth dimension in Gen State? When I was talking with the Master Samael on Vior about that, I was talking about the power of Faust, that had the power to enter here in this room and to appear in Australia and materialize there. And that is the power of resurrection. But Master Samael said, I didn't achieve that yet. I can enter into the fourth dimension, but I cannot go out of it for a couple of hours and return. Because there is a law in the fourth dimension that in order to return into the three-dimensional world, you have to return exactly in the same place where you entered. That's a law. So if I enter here in the in Gina State, I have to go back into the three-dimensional world in this same place. But a resurrected master enters here and goes out any place in the universe. They control the fourth dimension. They control the world of Yetzirah, the world of formation, because they belong to the world of formation, the world of Yetzirah. And the master, Samael, at that time, still didn't belong to the world of Yetzirah, physically speaking, but only to Asia. And of course, what do we need in order to experience the fourth dimension before reaching purification and sanctity? To practice. One day I asked the master, Master, but this is very difficult, right? To enter the fourth dimension, you need to be purified. To annihilate how many egos? And then his answer was, the witches and sorcerers enter. So, if they enter, why not you? You are also a devil, so try. Another question. Here. Thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,